we go. Okay. Hello, Jennifer. <laughs> Hello. Gina. So I'd love to start off by asking why you joined Climate Cultures. I joined Climate Cultures primarily because I met Mark at a uh, climate change tipping point conference uh, probably about three or four years ago now, um, mm. which he co-organised. And uh, it was actually for me, it was a seminal event. It brought together, it was the last of its kind. It brought together scientists and artists. Um, Kate Rayworth was one. She talked about donut economics mm. there. And... Um, mm. There was a sense at the conference that all of the work had been done by the scientists. They had told us everything they know. From now on, it's just a matter of tweaking dates, figures, bring it forward a few months, make the feedback loop worse. Um, but generally, the, the basic premise of climate change is before us. We know all we need to know. And the artists were feeling quite despondent because they felt that they'd engaged in activities of communication and basically the message wasn't getting across. Um, mm -hmm. At some point in the conference on the Saturday evening, I think there was a quite a remarkable shift in energy and um, a lot more women became be, began speaking. Um, mm -hmm. There was a softening of the approach, which was looking for solutions and um, there was much more talk of spirituality and okay. changing the paradigm, shifting paradigms. And, and some quite sort of remarkable things happened on, on what I would call a spirit level. And um, some, from my point of view, some extremely close friendships and connections and collaborations were formed in that weekend, more so than I've ever made in um, my useless history of networking which I just <laughs> can't do as a, as a professional thing so this was very organic very natural um the project I'll be talking to you about later Duende came out of that weekend as well and uh okay. I met and I was so impressed with Mark's organization how he'd worked at how he'd um organized this very 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 big conference in a very relaxed um and open manner and mm his venture was setting up climate cultures and it was a continuing of the conversations really that had started at that weekend that are par of paramount importance and the connections between people try to build up those networks forge those relationships broaden our visions and our sense of connectivity with other people working um to bring about change and um with certain reservations which is internet overload i joined mm -hmm. climate cultures and um i think that the work that Mark's been doing has uh, has been really remarkable. Mm. Uh, so that was the how I came to why I came to join it. Okay, and had you done any sort of environmental art work before that, or was that when you started? How did you get into it? No, it's been a real passion for as long as I have been an artist, really. Um, okay. But it's, I am sure many people will recognise the phases through which it's passed um, and, <laughs> and into which it's going. So I've, I started off in a very didactic um, phase and I sewed enormous um, paintings out of plastic bags and I... Oh, wow. Had, yes, I, was, I worked for uh, quite a long while at the Royal Academy and I worked on the Monet exhibition, which, if anybody remembers, had the, his enormous late canvases in the final room, just the most exquisite and beautiful works of art. Um, but his process, actually, of Giverny and the, uh, the, the, um, the water lilies in the garden it was a very... Uh, he manipulated nature, he changed local water courses and oh. he picked out the elements within the frame that he didn't want to see. <laughs> and so it's all much more artificial than this beautiful sort of vision of nature looks. And the exhibition itself was just the most unbelievably excessive 1980s marketing razzmatazz and um, <laughs> totally destructive to the environment and plastic, mm. the plastic bags that were, you know, uh, produced to sell products for the money. Oh, I see. It was just, it was quite obscene. So I made a life-size painting of his last canvas made out of cut of plastic. 
<laughs> and then it's sat in my studio for years. It was really beautiful. I was surprised at how incredibly beautiful it was. And in the end, yeah. it just ended up in the bin. Oh, so no. It was environmental, didn't have much of a message, but it was an important phase of learning that, um, uh, yes. Uh, so, anyway, it's gone from those sort of quite, I would say now, quite obvious um, protests, protest art. Okay. Uh, that in themselves are not necessarily very environmentally sensitive um, in the uh, resources that they use. Although I have always, okay. always, always tried to be very light on my feet um, and light in, in terms of the resources that I use to make my work, how it's transported. Okay. Um, so those elements are an, are an absolutely intrinsic part of my practice and becoming ever more so. So um, okay. uh that's how the journey began so always been sort of concerned about it and then um I've lightened and lightened and lightened and following the um climate change conference I organized the festival of the dark in Reading which was a year-long um festival that was specifically concerned with uh environmental the environmental crisis and the okay. premise behind that was to re-embrace the circle of the year and the seasonal cycles of uh, light and dark of winter, autumn, mm. spring and summer. Mm. Um, and to acknowledge the fact that that slowing down part of the cycle is an absolutely intrinsic part of life and the death part of the cycle is the supreme connection point that's mm. always chasing the spring and summer of life. You must have the autumn and the winter Mm. And in the winter, the seed dies, it goes underground, it overwinters, and then in the spring, it shoots up again with the new season's growth, and that's absolutely the way we live. So it was going back to the idea of Kate Rowus, uh, talking of the exp the lie of the exponential growth, co uh, growth curve of capitalism and right. her circular economy, and this is absolutely, for me, framed in the, um, the cycle of life. Mm. So it might seem slightly parallel to the the real sort of, you know, nuts and bolts of the environmental crisis. But for me, it's where I'm at, moving more and more into working with this. I believe that if you can't accept the downtime, if you can't accept the dark, mm -hmm. if you can't accept the the shadows, the, the monsters, the mm. questions that lurk beneath the surface. If you're always, always, always running, racing, chasing the light, mm. then you are on that cycle to destruction because it's only by being still, by being quiet and by completely embracing the fact that death and decay endings are part of our cycle that you learn to live in harmony with everything else that lives within the seasons of nature we are the only species that don't mm. um, so yeah. that's that's really how i'm uh, what I'm, I'm focusing on now in my in my practice okay so so what are you up to at the moment so right at this moment i am engaged in two main bodies of work and one of them is painting okay so i'm back in my studio which is a converted garage tiny little space but uh, <laughs> it serves me beautifully and um I've been painting they're really they're, they're strange works I think for me what has become very clear to me in the last year probably is that the studio is a is a locus that's what I call a locus a locus for spirit a place of spirit okay. um some people might use their own sort of terminology for that place of prayer, place of mm. sacred space, whatever. But um, it's got a it's got a presence and it's got a layered energy that's built up over years and years of, of working in there. And um, what has become super clear to me now is that my work is not about product; um, it is about process, which is. Okay. Um, words that are sort of bandied around and I've never understood them fully but uh, what I fully understand now is that it's not the work that I create per se that is important it is uh, and therefore the two questions people will always ask an artist is where do you exhibit and 
how, do you make a how much of a living you know do you make a living <laughs> always the and yeah. uh, they've tortured me tortured me as with most artists I'm sure for years and years and years and what's become really super clear for me now is it's not about the product if I create something beautiful that expresses something that is other then I'm thrilled by it so I won't you know mm. pretend about that and if somebody wants to share that work through buying it or buying a print of it or whatever then that is a thrilling experience because I feel <laughs> that I'm sharing it's lovely yeah but it's not why I create it. So it's the it's it's okay. like Michael, Michelangelo said with his late work that he released something within the, his stones that needed releasing. And as soon as he'd released it, he let it go. So a lot of his final work looks unfinished. Um, oh. Super powerful. Um, okay. And that's really what I'm doing is I'm releasing whatever needs to be released and it doesn't matter what it is. And so I'm much less judgmental now about my um, my products. Okay. <laughs> um, which is also very much a, a capitalist word, isn't it? Yeah, Product. definitely uh, is. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. So rejecting that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so that's the that's the one body of work that I'm I'm really focusing on at the moment with writing. I, I write as well. Okay. Uh, there's a synergy between the two that's that's growing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other string to the bow at present is a huge uh, and very exciting very beautiful project that also came out of the tipping point weekend uh -huh. and uh that is working with um a wonderful partner and she's become a very close friend now um andrea carr mm -hmm. who is a eco scenographer she was one of the first people to really question the excesses of theater and to say that it's not just being eco aware is not just about um, creating, I don't know, costumes out of secondhand materials. It is holding the environment and the principle of ecology in your creative practice right from the mm. onset, right from the outset, all the way through the process to the final manifestation, whatever that might be. And in theatre, that, as you can imagine, is a huge challenge. Mm. So she's co-founded EcoStage and um, uh, we met on the staircase in uh, Warwick at this weekend. <laughs> the best place that to meet. That they do, yeah. <laughs> she was fascinated by Lorca and a particular play that he wrote that is uh, its main characters, all of its characters are insects. And she was fascinated by Lorca, insects and flamenco and the connection between flamenco movements and insect movement. Mm. And I was at the time reading Lorca, which makes us both sound highly intelligent and <laughs> was some sort of random happening. Um, so I was reading Lorca and in particular um, some short essays of his that are concerned with uh, Canto Hondo, Deep Song and Duende. Um, and Duende mm. is the, um, the ultimate spirit of life. And mm. it is the, the energy that drives life and mm. is totally rooted in nature. And all of his, um, his poetry is rooted in the Andalusian countryside. Mm. And there was clearly a connection that was meant to happen in this conversation. So we uh, hooked yeah. up a few, a couple of months later and the long and the short is that we have embarked on a work of theater that is called Duende. Um, it's based on a script that I've written, but we've deconstructed the script. Okay. We're seeing the entire gathering of the material as a, as a score uh, into which sound worlds and visuals will weave and um covid has covid was actually absolutely at the heart of the script without us knowing <laughs> it so it was about some sort of calamity that stopped the world in its tracks and there's two socially distanced insects who have been mm. told that should a calamity happen this is what they must do so they're waiting underground they're waiting they're waiting mm. to be rescued they're waiting for the badness to stop mm. and then they can go outside and pretend nothing's happened and carried on as before and that was the premise of the plane <laughs> I thought that it was some 
it's an unnamed catastrophe, I assumed okay. it was ecological. Uh, it's turned out to be COVID, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now Amazing. the irony is that the theatre, the piece of theatre itself has been affected by this right. stopping the world in its tracks and it now needs to negotiate its own way, manoeuvre its own way through that. Mm. Having taken on board already in the very slow process of, of working through it, um, the Trump march in Britain, the Trump years, Brexit, Black Lives Matter, mm. um, uh, racial murder in Reading, um, incidents that have happened in our own lives, Andrea's personal life, the death of her mother in my own personal life. Mm. Um, and for us, what is growing clearer and clearer about this piece of work is that ecology begins on your doorstep and mm. that ecological art or environmentally aware art is not, for us at least, it's not about going out, um, proclaiming, um, protesting. There's absolutely a, a space for that there's a, there's no it's not either or and I was heavily involved in XR for two or three years mm. um but for us it's it's about this awareness that ecology absolutely be begins on your own doorstep it begins with your own life with your own life story with how you live in connection with your community your environment your mm. land mm. even that patch of ground upon which you tread to go down to the local shops and from that it grows larger and larger and larger and larger and larger until it becomes the world labyrinth mm -hmm. and it draws in all of the tangled webs and of old myth ancient myths how we suppress again going back to the idea of the um, festival of the dark how we suppress that dangerous darker side of ourselves that uh, mm -hmm. we don't wish to face how that suppression of those instincts will eventually manifest in a prototype like Trump, who is all of us. Um, and that it's only by having the courage to really walk through that labyrinth and through all of those aspects of fear and reality and um, karma, ancestral stuff, all of that, that we come finally to confront what it is that blocks us from a from a, a true connection with ourselves and our 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 environment and and nature. Um, and until we make that journey, we can shout all we like, but nothing fundamentally, I believe, is going to change. Mm. Um, so it's uh, at, the, at this moment we're applying for an arts council. Seeing as they brought the arts council grants back for a very limited length of time, we're applying for uh, research and development money and okay. connecting with extraordinary um, artists and practitioners who just seem to be appearing. And this is how Duende has been working. It's been working in a very fluid, very organic way. We've been using. Um, the methods of chance that uh, John Cage, Brian Eno, um, artists have used uh, serendipity, following the Tao, whatever you choose to call it. Um, so okay. it's been highly disciplined, very systematic process, but always using a systematic process to allow chance to direct us. Um, because it's very important that it ends up being democratic, being okay. that we are led rather than driving or directing um so that we're very open to the message of what it is what our role is in this um in using our gifts um okay can you give me an example of that so being you're, you're yeah so you're, you've got a, a structure but you allow chance to yes so happen our very first um experiment with that was we were having we were talking about so there's a there's a um artistic family called the Boyle family who stuck pins and maps traveled off to an area following the precise location of the pin and when they got there they took an imprint of I think they were fiberglass resin took an imprint of the landscape <clears throat> and uh, whatever that happened to be so a tire mark or a dirty gravel yard or a um, <laughs> piece of grass and they ended up with these artifacts that they then exhibited and the purpose of that was was very um, 
clearly uh, art is, is everywhere and art is not abstract, it's not distant, it's not elitist, it's here, right in your backyard, creativity is here. Uh, we, so we took ideas like that and so we were talking about you know sticking pins and maps and then traveling off there and doing this and that and then Andrea said uh, well why don't we just go and do it <laughs> so we walked <laughs> outside of a Brixton flat which is not very far from Brixton tube and we um, span a pen set ourselves one minute or two minutes can't remember now it's, uh, to walk in the direction that the pin that the pen pointed okay we had certain provocations, so we took a take. We would take a, sele a randomly selected piece of text, um, so call out a page number, print off a piece of text, okay. and uh, go into that unseen. And uh, had certain questions that we posed. So today we want to find out about such and such. Anyway, we set off feeling slightly like a couple of lemons trying to sort of, you know we weren't doing what we were doing <laughs> yeah. um, and then it all just happened it happened so clearly so precisely um so the best example of it was um part of the script is about uh two children needing to find their mother and the text is lead me to your mama um so we set the question and this is always a two hour time journey so we set the question okay. leave your mama where's mama where's mama that was the question span the pen follow the direction two minutes passed we came to a stop and we were standing outside a door of a shop set in a railway arch in Brixton and it was called Papa's store and <laughs> yeah quite freaked out by it actually <laughs> we were quite freaked out by the whole journey yeah. So, yeah, uh, that was just one episode. And in yeah. going into Papa's store, uh, a long story cut short, we end up talking to the woman, young woman, beautiful young woman who was running the shop. And she had the most remarkable story of um, having to leave India because of personal, of religious persecution, having to leave behind her two very, very small children, oh. to come over to Britain to work in a shop being exploited in terms of pay, in terms of rent, mm. in terms of our own foreign office who were mm. refusing to allow her leave to remain, but charging her thousands of pounds every year to keep renewing her visa mm. so that she was a cash cow for the foreign office. Mm. A really desperately upsetting story, but a powerful story and an absolute story about mother. Right. And that then became clear that we were being direct to take these journeys onto the street and to collect people's stories okay with reference to the script so that it's not just mm. going out and saying tell us your story there was purpose and clarity mm. behind it and mm. that these will be somehow incorporated into, into the piece um without us mm. going out to seek that and the mm. whole of the process of Duende has developed in that sort of form remarkable absolutely remarkable mm. and you quite literally couldn't make it up if you tried so right um, <laughs> That is um, incredible. Yeah. Amazing. So when did you start the work for Duende? I think it was two years ago. It's been a... Okay. And we can't speed it up. That's the other thing that's <laughs> so interesting about it. We absolutely cannot force it. And, yeah. Um, you know, every time we keep trying to, oh, we're going to nail it today. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. It's interesting yeah. now that the Arts Council application does seem to be bringing things together very quickly in a much more... Okay. Cohesive fashion. So it's now beginning to look a little bit like something. Um, okay. But it, it just, it will do it in its own time and in its own way. And um, mm. it's, it's powerful. It's, it's, it's the most extraordinary thing I've ever been involved in. So uh, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Fun. So is it, it's, it's you, you and Andrea, are the kind of core, but you've gathered some other people now, have you? Uh, we just in the process of doing it. So people that okay. we've met or worked with who seem to have qualities that lend themselves to the um, to the work. So we're going to organise some digitally, some hopefully in some form of, um, of, of physical presence, um, some <laughs> days of exploration. Um, okay. <coughs> and it, it just, sorry, yeah, carry on. No, I was just going to ask, when do you envisage it being ready? 
or do you not is that part of it you don't know and you can't know just don't know and mm. um and and can't know um but on the the R&D will probably I think happen in if we get the funding which I'm quite confident of mm. um it'll be I should imagine we'll start doing this round about May June okay. and then put on two or three scratch performances um okay so that we can share some of the material that we've been gathering and get people to really tell us what it feels like what mm. works what doesn't what they would like to see how it would be uh strengthened going forward um because mm. this definitely feels like very much the beginning of the the actual specifically theatrical mm. journey um mm. and then after that i don't know i don't know what's happening with arts council funding covid um yeah any of that but it, none of it feels like a an obstacle it all feels like this is something that we are being asked to do is to to walk forward in a different manner so to um so to take i think it's not going to be top down it's going to be bottom up and it's going to be light on the ground and it's it's um it's not going to um hurt the earth it's going to be in a sacred journey really so mm. we've been talking a bit about um the aboriginal walking of the land walk about yeah mm. and revitalizing the land re sanctifying it through the walk and it feels like that's very much part of it that um it's not about performance it's about re-energizing um the land the community um the vision the promise the whatever it is it's about doing that and doing that in community so um working with extraordinary people who bring their gifts to it in a particularly performative way working with people who are extraordinary but quietly extraordinary and um bringing their mm beautiful gifts into the piece and honoring the land um mm. and inviting people into connection with with the land and with nature um and how that actually happened you know we've got we've got we've got visions but the how it will happen there's a garden in it there's a garden fundamentally there's a garden there's a labyrinth a maze a garden and um We've, we we feel that there's somewhere there's somewhere that's waiting to oh i see to appear in, we don't know yeah <laughs> i was going to ask is it site specific <clears throat> or could it could it be done anywhere i think it will always respond to the um to the site that feels that feels really important but um i found somewhere in reading again just led there very much by instinct um and it's 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 absolutely extraordinary place it's down by the river the river thames area of exquisite beauty that had a business park built on it oh and yeah. the business park has now basically gone bust uh it was bg shell and they've shut down that premises but they're um landlords of it so it's and they've got to keep mm. it in decent repair and hand it back as they found it so it's this extraordinary a set of buildings office blocks um mm. glass plated just beautiful underground car park that's totally empty really and reflective patterns and then you've got the nature and the river right there and uh it's just it's screaming for duende but shell are about the most um <laughs> unlikely landlords to grant any <laughs> kind permission so um <laughs> we're just having a slight debate at the moment whether we uh, sorry i've just lost you whether we um do it in a sort of guerrilla form not in the building but it's certainly okay. car, which is extraordinary uh or we ask permission and get refused and if we ask permission and get refused then it's quite difficult to do the guerrilla part so right <laughs> <laughs> but that also feels really very much part of the of the journey who owns who owns the, mm. the space who owns the territory who owns our land who has mm. permission to say yes who has the right to say no and how do you 
um, speak truth to power is a phrase that I really love. How mm. do you, in your own practice, in whatever way you choose to do and you feel fit, how do you speak truth to power and how do you do it with integrity, but also absolutely crucially with a, with a respect for your own energy. So which battles do you choose to fight? Which mm. battles do you learn are not worth fighting? Um, yeah. And how do you negotiate with your own energy levels and your own sustainable practice to uh, create what you need to create without burning out yourself? And mm. that's um, a really important question that I think anybody who's involved in um, in a field of passion that is political or um, has a has a, a purpose behind it I think there's there's such a massive danger of burnout because we mm. uh, we can't um, we can drain, we can drain so easily if you're bashing yourself up against massive institutions, against um, mm -hmm. blocks of power that don't want to know, that um, hold up the barricade and won't let you pass and you just keep on bashing and bashing and bashing at them, um, mm. getting thrilled when you find some small little <laughs> enclave where you can... Yeah pop in for half an hour or, you know, <laughs> pop in for an, a, a year and do something that you feel is worthwhile and then it, it closes its doors and you feel you're right back there and nothing's changed and you've expended right. all that energy. Um, I think learning how to just accept that we can only do what we can in whatever way that we can do it and that might be so much smaller mm. uh, and so much quieter and simpler mm. than we wished but that is maybe all that's needed or all that we can do um, mm. I feel as though that's very much a, an XR principle as well is looking after yourself and they always have I haven't been super involved um with them but I always see that they have a well-being tent and they have people there to just check in with everyone so is that is that something that you yeah. learned there, or was this something you no, learned no, no, anyway? I think, I think for, interestingly for me, what I learned in XR, um, whom I have enormous respect for, pride in, I think they're mm. remarkable. Um, I learned that I burnt out. I was in danger of burning out in my uh, work with with them um which oh, i was okay. pacing myself i was pacing myself as as well as i could and i just um i think i also realized it was not my james hillman uh, came has has this really wonderful um expression of finding your own tree that we each have a tree that we're up we up we live in a particular tree okay. and learning to recognize what your own tree is and learning to accept it is a fundamental principle to healthy living and if you look over at somebody else's tree that looks like it's doing something so much more valuable and so much more worthwhile mm -hmm. and you try your hardest to come down from your tree and go over and scramble up that tree and you spend a lot of time in that tree thinking this just doesn't feel <laughs> comfortable um, right. it must be me I must be crap I must be these other people are so much better and mm -hmm. they're doing something so wonderful and my tree over there looks so small now and it looks mm. so silly and da -de da -de da It's all such a waste of energy. Yeah. Stay in your tree, find out what your <laughs> tree is. And <laughs> so I wasn't a political activist. I'm uh, okay. Oh, I've done my bit. I've, I've finished mm. with that. I, I, I have. I've really spoken out. I've, I've been quite passionately involved with a number of, of causes and mm. put a lot of uh, time and energy and focus into it and those are not my tree anymore I'm in my I'm in my uh I don't know I'm, I'm hiding in an oak doing my <laughs> doing my thing and uh, that, feels, that feels right so yeah so yeah Great. I think it's I think it's that I think it's finding out what um feeds you and what burns you out and making sure that you don't reflect badly on yourself you just get out of those situations yeah yeah that's that's really interesting actually and I think especially in with environmental work you always want to do more because <laughs> like, oh I could be doing this I could be doing I could be going 
on a yeah. march every weekend but actually that might not be the best thing for no. you but the imperative is there quite clearly because we are as they say we are running out of time there is no it's not something that mm. it's not even like it's not like any other crisis which mm. however terrible it is and however worthy the, the cause is ongoing if you know what i mean that mm. um like you know jesus said the poor will always be with us he wasn't saying that's a great thing he was just stating a fact <laughs> but climate change has a a clock attached to it and it's mm. and everything that you hear about it is that um we're almost too late maybe we are too late perhaps it's too late we gotta do it now and yes. so you, <laughs> you have that yeah. sense you just can't yeah. you can't get your foot off the i mean that's an interesting god what an analogy to use for that you can't get your foot off the accelerator uh, you can't <laughs> yeah. in any way, but it does give something of the yeah the mixed messages the mixed energy and yeah. uh, gee, we can't we just can't do it and if we can't stop it we can't stop it it's mm. it's as it is really um Mm. So yes, I think finding our own level of balance within it is is critical. Yeah. And is there any other eco art or environmental art or performance or event project that that you found really inspirational or impactful or um, you enjoyed? <laughs> Left an impression on you. Uh, yes. So. I think the revelation for me in a way has been to um, reframe my understanding of, of labels. Um, okay. And so, gosh, how funny, two things spring to mind. The one thing, so there are exhibitions that I have been to that have just opened up something within me that is beautiful and that makes me go wow that's influenced me that's changed me in in some way um so an example is uh, the joan jonas exhibition at tate modern um okay i loathe tate modern everything about <laughs> tate modern i absolutely loathe <laughs> a principle of all that in fact i once organized i shall tell you about that because i i'm that that was quite an event I many many years ago I organized a, a happening in Tate modern and uh -huh. um, we took in an old decrepit lady old lady in a wheelchair with blankets over her knees and we went upstairs to these you know through that massive turbine hall, just speaking power and <laughs> masculine might and all the rest of it. <laughs> trailed up to one of the galleries and there's a big piano hanging from the ceiling and all the keys sort of fall out every half hour and then they all get raveled back in and um we were just out there when Audrey was in the wheelchair and uh she was one of Les Dawson's original roly ponies who were a group of old women who tap danced um, <laughs> okay Brilliant. and then the brother of a school friend of mine who's he's a really wonderful um Rastafarian sax player, busker, mm -hmm. and he wandered into the gallery and he pulled out his sax and he started playing it and she threw off her blankets and she leapt out of the wheelchair oh. and started tap dancing. And um, oh, brilliant. <laughs> it was so, 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 so wonderful and um, so challenging. Actually, it's, it's so challenging f on so many levels. The security came in, oh. uh, black guy who went up to mm. Michael and started saying to him you're not allowed here and Michael just chatted to him and said I'm mm. not doing any harm this is okay so he went off and he was obviously conflicted and mm. so it carried on and then the security came through and they all just started marching through the gallery um at which point we just melted into uh, okay. various so it was it did it yeah it was powerful it was it was really great um very proud yeah. of that so that's a digression <laughs> <laughs> but they That's do okay. stay some really fantastic um exhibitions and Joan Jonas who um takes the everyday and creates art from it and it's joyous and it's simple and it's tatty and it's um uh impromptu and it's clever it's thoughtful it's not it, it it's it's thorough it's okay. and it has real sort of understanding and intention about what she's doing um 
but it brings a sense of celebration into um back into the ordinary into um mm. it's a democratic form of art and i just I, I really love that and for me that's a that's one of the crucial strands of environmental art so i find that inspiring um uh, Ma making I feel like making um climate change and environmentalism an everyday thing has been quite a theme um and I, just the talks that I've done already um that's definitely a thing you know because it's such a big thing yeah but making it every day is kind of key making it part of people's everyday lives seems yes. to be a real big theme yes the art yeah um and making it something for me, I think what's becoming clearer and clearer is making it something that is not about um, doom hmm. and not about lecturing and not hmm. about you must do this or you must stop doing this or you must do that. Hmm. For me, the absolute key is creating a sense of wonder that, that makes you so connected. I'm just sitting here looking at this extraordinary holly tree outside and thinking... <laughs> If you could get somebody to see that, you wouldn't need to say anything about climate change. Yeah. They would have a sense of connection with that tree that would then stimulate something within them that would put out different feelers, different antennae that would want to protect that tree, that would want to be in a world that had such trees, that would want to be there if the council came to try and chop that tree down for whatever reason. And, right. and so for me, those seeds are really um powerful and it just brings back to mind the second thing that i thought about when you asked me that mm. question was um many 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 years ago i was in wales i was on a beach a stony beach in wales and something made me glance well i always look down i'm looking at the stones and pebbles <laughs> and and somebody had and this is way 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 before the pebble thing of sticking pebbles around for other people to find it was a pebble on the beach that somebody had drawn a sandal, a footed sandal on, and it fitted the pebble so exquisitely. And it was a little line drawing in pencil. It wasn't an amazing work of art. And it was an amazing work of art. Mm. And I saw it there and it's one of the most precious, precious things I have ever been given or gifted. <laughs> and the person who created that will never know unless they're watching this now <laughs> they will never know the impact that it's had and for me it was just this moment of somebody has created something I don't even know if they left it or if they just you know it was a doodle mm. and they just didn't think it had any importance at all and they left this wondrous little object on the beach and I found mm. it and it changed my world and I just think there's um for me that's environmental art that is that's 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 it yeah that's brilliant Thank you.